From VOA Learning English, this is the Technology Report in Special English. An international rights group has called on world governments to ban weaponized robots. Human Rights Watch recently released a report called Losing Humanity, the Case Against Killer Robots. It warns that fully autonomous weapons systems could increase the risk to civilians during armed conflicts. Militaries around the world are using unmanned aerial vehicles, also called drones, more and more. The drones gather intelligence, help identify targets, and fire weapons, but only if a human operator gives the order. Human Rights Watch fears that within 30 years, developments in technology could remove the need for human operators. David Metham is the United Kingdom Director of Human Rights Watch. He says his group is concerned that robots will not be able to tell the difference between civilians and combatants. The United States and other militaries have stated they have no plans to remove human supervision over the decision to use deadly force. Human Rights Watch says a treaty would help to guarantee that this does not happen. The group says a ban on what it calls killer robots would be similar to current bans on the use of landmines and cluster bombs. Some experts say that all autonomous technology should be discussed. For example, France sent remote-controlled robots to Japan last year to help contain the nuclear disaster at the Fukushima Power Center. This was a job that most people would agree was better left to machines. For VOA Learning English, I'm Alex Villarreal. This is Alex Villarreal with the VOA Special English Technology Report, formerly called the Development Report. Before we changed the name, we went on our Facebook page and asked for story ideas. Some of you suggested that we talk about ICT, Information and Communication Technology. Well, the International Telecommunication Union, a United Nations agency, released its latest ICT Facts and Figures report in October. Since 2005, the number of Internet users worldwide has doubled to more than one and a half billion people. At least two billion are expected to be online by the end of this year. The ITU says more than 70 percent of new Internet users this year will be in developing countries. Still, only 21 percent of the population of the developing world is online, compared to 71 percent in developed countries. Susan Telcher is head of the agency's Market Information and Statistics Division in Switzerland. She says there are still very huge divides when it comes to accessing the Internet, especially high-speed Internet. In Africa, not even 10 percent of the population is using the Internet. Fewer than 16 percent of homes in developing countries are wired for the Internet. But on the other hand, 
Ms. Telcher says mobile phone usage has reached 68 percent in developing countries. The world has almost 7 billion people. Nine out of 10 now have access to mobile networks. The ITU estimates that mobile subscriptions will reach 5 billion 300 million this year. The majority are in the developing world. And Susan Telcher says more and more people in developing countries are using their mobile phones to connect to the Internet. Ms. Telcher says mobile technology is already improving lives in developing countries. She points to examples like banking by phone, e-health services, and farm reports by text messaging. And the possibilities will only grow as broadband or high-speed connections become more widely available. ITU Secretary General Hamadoun Touré calls broadband the next truly transformational technology. He also calls it the most powerful tool available in the race to meet the Millennium Development Goals by 2015. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. Join us online at voaspecialenglish.com or on Facebook or Twitter at VOA Learning English. I'm Alex Villarreal with the VOA Special English Technology Report. Silicon Valley in Northern California is home to many of the world's largest technology companies. These include Apple, Google, Oracle, Intel, Cisco Systems, and Hewlett Packard. The Valley is also home to the Computer History Museum in Mountain View. It reopened in December after $19 million worth of improvements. One of the additions is a permanent exhibit called Revolution, the first 2,000 years of computing. Alex Bohanek is a curator at the museum. Mr. Bohanek says the new exhibit tells the story of more than 1,000 historical objects. He said some of the oldest items are actually not computers, they are devices that helped people calculate. And the first object people see walking into the exhibit is an abacus from the 1800s. Because the abacus is a daily use device made from wood, few of them have survived. Mr. Bohanek says people have the chance to handle some of the objects in the exhibit. He says one of the more popular items is a portable computer from 1981. The Osborne One was about the size of a sewing machine and weighed more than 10 kilograms. So just being able to pick one of those up will help visitors understand how difficult portability was about 30 years ago. Visitors to the Computer History Museum can also see parts of one of the earliest large-scale electronic computing devices. The ENIAC, or Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer, was designed during World War II. There are also pieces from the guidance computer that was used during the Apollo space missions. Mr. Bohanek says the Revolution exhibit is about more than the history of modern computing. He says it tells a much larger story about how these developments have affected society and culture, especially in recent years. He said the revolution to most people is that computers are everywhere. If you are crossing the street, there probably is a computer 
controlling the traffic light. Computers surround us. In some cases, they are even inside us, like the cardiac pacemaker device in the exhibit. The Computer History Museum plans to launch an online version of the exhibit in March. The museum has 100,000 items in its complete collection. Only 2% of them are currently on display. But officials say 75% of the items will be viewable online. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. This is the VOA Special English Technology Report. Using a computer mouse or trackball can be a little tricky. You choose the object you want and move it to where you want it, only to have it end up in a different position. This happens to all of us sometimes, and we think little of it. But for people who have a difficult time controlling their movements, this little navigational issue can be a really big problem. Now, researchers at the University of Washington have developed new cursors that make activating objects easier for people with motor disabilities. Jacob Wobrock is an assistant professor at the University of Washington. He leads the AIM research group that developed the cursors. Professor Wobrock says mouse cursor operations are complex processes that assume things about computer users. He says, for many people who have poor dexterity, the inability to control their fingers well, maybe pain in their wrists or hand, maybe arthritis, those assumptions of the average user, they don't hold. The AIM research group has developed two cursors. One is called the pointing magnifier. Professor Wobrock says it uses a large circular cursor instead of the traditional arrow pointer. Users can make the circle as big as they like. When the circle is positioned over the target, everything in the circle appears larger, almost filling the whole screen. This makes it easier for the user to click on the object. Inside that magnified view, the user sees the regular point cursor, the little arrow, and with that, they can click on the target they want, or they can move the target. The AIM Research Group's pointing magnifier software can be downloaded free from the University of Washington website. AIM is short for Accessible, Interactive, and Mobile. Professor Wobrock says the group's main goal is to make information and computer systems more available and easier to use. And he says AIM's work is not just for people with disabilities. People usually think of accessibility as having to do with someone's physical or cognitive state. But Professor Wobrock says some projects have looked at situational impairments. These are challenges to accessibility that are caused more by the situation that the computer user is in. An example of this might be trying to walk and use a small mobile device at the same time. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. MP3s, podcasts, and transcripts of our reports are at voaspecialenglish.com. We're also on Facebook and Twitter at VOA Learning English. From VOA Learning English, this is the Technology Report. A United Nations special investigator recently called for a ban on the production and use of lethal 
autonomous robotics, known as LARS. Critics say these killer robots may one day choose and strike targets independently without human direction. UN official Christoph Haynes says the lack of human commanders raises many moral and ethical questions about Lars. He spoke in May at a meeting of the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva, Switzerland. He says the taking of any human life deserves a basic level of consideration. Mr. Haynes says the deployment of machines to kill people may be unacceptable because the world has yet to agree on legal responsibility in such cases. He says killer robots should not have the power of life and death over human beings. He disagrees with people who say robots could help reduce the possibility of what they call riskless wars. Mr. Haynes says people make mistakes. They can act out of fear or be driven by revenge or cruelty. But unlike robots, they can also act out of compassion. He says humans consider many different things in each situation they face. Drone aircraft have also been a point of debate in recent years. These vehicles are piloted by a person on the ground. Many countries have drone programs. Drone strikes have helped the United States in its battle against militants in countries such as Afghanistan and Pakistan. In May, President Obama said the use of drone strikes must be held to high standards. He called the use of drones effective, but he noted that the new technology raises what he called profound questions. For VOA Learning English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti.